Hey folks, welcome to No Tech Talk, and that's K-N-O-W, Tips, Advice, and Consulting for your business's IT. I'm your host, Barb Paluskowicz, and for those of you taking notes, Paluskowicz is spelled the exact way it sounds, Paluskowicz. You can see it on our company's website, cdntechnologies.com. What I want to share with you today is how data breaches are impacting our economy. Warren Buffett says cyber attacks are the number one problem with mankind, even worse than nuclear weapons. And ransomware attacks are up 105% in Q1 of this year over last year. And victims of cybercrime include all of us who bank with BMO, fly with Air Canada, use Canada Post. And then there's the people of Wasega Beach and Midland. And these are the ones that we hear about. And actually, the biggest one that's happened, which is like the juiciest one, has been on the low, 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 and that's the Panama Papers. Mm. It's the biggest and the juiciest. 2.6 terabytes of data, 11.5 million files about how the rich and famous hide their money in offshore accounts. Even the CRA got in on that action when the world's fourth largest biggest offshore law firm, Mossack Panesca, suffered a breach. And the easiest way essentially to avoid being a victim of a cyber crime is to avoid the internet and to never click on a bad email and a bad website or bad text or, or anything free. Because once your information is out there, once you're part of a breach, um, the things that people are going to find out about you are, do you know, Phil? Phil's with me here today. I think it's hard to to function without the internet these days. It is reason. super hard. Yeah. But once your information is out there, people are going to know everything about you. Schools. 100%. Yes. Mm-hmm. Schools you've attended, mm-hmm. current and previous employers, your job titles, how much you made, your credit fa- score, credit score, mm. tax information, Ooh. banking information, charities you donated to, phone numbers, email address, pet names, shopping wish lists, mm-hmm. um, any type of banking that you do yeah, even if you're offline let's say you choose not to do anything online you mm-hmm. go to your bank you pay a bill guess where it goes through that's exactly it yeah i need a confirmation even now when you buy something mm-hmm. um they ask you do you want your receipt do you want emailed to you so where's all this information being stored because once people have your information it's easy for them to apply for credit cards mm-hmm. and for any type of small amount of credit from from a vendor and that usually ends up leading to bigger things such as mortgages. So at any time during this show, you can reach out to me at No Tech Talk, and that's K-N-O-W. I, Barbara Plusquich, am the author of IT Scams, How to Avoid Being Ripped Off, and am the CEO and founder of CDNTechnologies.com. We are your go-to specialist for preventing you from being a victim of a cybercrime. We're a managed service company here in Mississauga, which is an outsourced IT company, and we provide IT service, IT support, and IT security to local companies in Mississauga, the GTA, and throughout North America. And we've been doing IT since 1989, protecting and preserving your data, and we've seen some changes, some good, some bad, and some ugly. Cyber attack, fraud, and how it impacts our economy is ugly. So today, I have a very special guest, Joe Smelko. He's your number one guy. We have Lou Skeezus. Lou Skeezus is with us here today to talk about cyber attacks and fraud and how it impacts our economy. Lou is an equities analyst, and he's relentless at economics. And for those of you listening, yes, it is the same Lou Skeezus featured on AM640, AM980, Report on Business Television, City TV, and he is a local celebrity to all of us here. Hey, Lou, how's it going? Hey, Barb. Great to be with you, Phil. Thanks for uh, coming aboard today. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, um, you know, when these people that are in the executive seats of companies and they fall victim to cyber attacks through no fault of their own, because, like, you know, they didn't personally do it, could have been an employee, do you think they should be called stupid or irresponsible? I think they're uh, just not diligent in supervising the people responsible for their security. For example, um, if you look at you know the FBI, would that be a credible source to you? Yeah. Federal Bureau of Investigation. In 2014, they came up with their own cyber most wanted list for the people that are breaking in to government 
and corporate databases and exploiting the information that they harvest from it. Okay, so are they responsible? Yes, they are responsible. These corporate executives have to be looking at the firewalls around their business. And, you know, if you look at Equifax as an example of a breach that was uh, just totally uh, a mess for all the people that use that service, they were aware of it and did nothing. So much like what we'll find many, many times, the man or woman at the rock face, as we'd say in mining, right, reporting up the channel to distracted management, and nothing happens. So I think that if you're not aware of the vulnerability, you're exposing your capital, your employees, your clients uh, to by not being diligent on the cybersecurity side, I think you're living in a delusional state. I couldn't have said it better myself. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Are you, are you looking to go hunt down somebody on the FBI's cyber most wanted list? Well, I see it all the time um, where executives, you know, they're like any quarter but this quarter or that's too, that's too expensive or we can't afford that. But I always find it ironic that after an incident occurs, you know what, they can't, they can't pay enough money fast enough, like they'll pay anything. Like, you know, and all of a sudden this money miraculously appears. But you know what, uh, a few months ago, they, they didn't have, they, they didn't have, it wasn't in their budget, like, you know what, a hundred bucks a month, 200 bucks a month. $200 a month for companies that are like, you know, at top line revenues are hitting like, you know, at um, 10, 20 million dollars. Like, you know, they're, they're looking at, I don't want to say chintz and out, but they essentially do. Like, you know, how can we cut back on this? Mm -hmm. Phil, what do you Increase profits. You know, this well, there's nothing actually. wrong with that except no. when, you know, that's what we call a false economy. Mm. So what's a false economy? That's when you try and economize on something and expose yourself to a much bigger potential risk. So as you were saying, Barb, uh, that's a false economy. That is not not an area that you want to economize on. I don't want to, I'm not saying gold plated. I'm saying have adequate security. And in fact, my research indicates and in my conversations with people in the uh, corporate security area with regards to their information and so on is that if you're a publicly traded company, uh, it's probably security is going to become a compliance issue, much like filing your quarterly results, letting everybody know at the same time about changes, material changes in the business. I think that with the uh, level of penetration beyond a corporation's firewalls, uh, they're, they're going to be required to be uh, more diligent about it and have the right protections for themselves, their employees, and their customers. How do you think that will change for the private sector? Do you think that they'll take notice of this and they'll start saying, oh, like, you know what, I want to grow, I want to do this, I need to have this, this, this? Well, it depends place. on who their clients are, right? So if I'm a, uh, if I'm a service provider, I'm mm -hmm. in somebody's supply chain and I want to sell to a client that is publicly traded, what do you think they're going to say to me? You need to meet this requirement. Huh? Yeah, because you now become a vulnerability to your client, right? If they can get into your system and then get into theirs, big problems. So for the private sector that thinks, well, we're too small, nobody cares, blah, blah, blah. The reality is uh, somebody in your chain of relationships is going to demand it from you. Yes, I see that all the time, you know, especially in the cannabis industry now, that's that's coming up, lots of security happening there, making sure your data is being backed up, you have your firewalls, you have your data protection, you have your uh, security awareness training, because you don't want any of this stuff leaked. Right, it's particularly sensitive data too, right? Oh, it's everything, like, you mm -hmm. know, when you're dealing with like dollars and cents and health and sexual orientation and, and things like that. Like those are big topics right now that are kind of like, like as Canadians, we don't really talk about, no talk about that or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Like it's a big, you can't identify yourself like as a certain way. And if you accidentally get that exposed, you're in like big, big, big trouble. But I think we're changing in that mm -hmm. domain. I mean, if you look at Tim Cook from Apple, Right within the uh, venture capital industry and in Silicon Valley, everybody in the know knew Tim was gay. 
Oh my god, I'm I'm the loser. I didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, what happened was there was an episode on CNBC where somebody in the know put it out there okay. and said, "Well, you know, I mean, Tim's gay," and he looked around to all the other people on the planet, much like you're looking at me. <laughs> And and they were saying, yeah, that's right. Their jaws were driving. I didn't know that. Now, some people criticize that commentator on CNBC for having outed Tim Cook. Mm -hmm. And Tim Cook subsequently stepped up and said, you know, I'm proud to be gay. You know, and he he took a more public position with regards to his. But up until that point, it was all, you know, guys in the know, no type of information. Gotcha. And sometimes when you don't know what you don't know, it's, it's not. That's why you got to hire somebody who does know. <laughs> That's true, right? Okay, so with all of these data breaches that are out there, hackers can have access to insider information. Do you see that as a problem for the stock market, Lou? Well, of course. I mean, uh, you know, let's face it. I mean, when I look at hackers and people like that, the only the only institution I want them to hack is the Canada Revenue Agency. <laughs> like, like, you know, if you want my support, you need to, you know, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Mm -hmm. So hackers in general, I'm not in favor of because they make my life less convenient. OK, so when you look at insider information, there's a ton of it. And there's actually industries that are centered around gathering information to help the mergers and acquisitions and arbitrage industries better identify. For example, uh, when I lived in Calgary in the oil patch, mm -hmm. there were people on the payroll looking to see who's meeting with who and where. Who's meeting with who and where? That's on your email, everybody, and your contacts. Your email gets yes. breached. That username and password is used in multiple locations. We're knowing what's going on. It's on your phone. It's on Facebook if you choose. Who's yeah. meeting where? They can show up. Yeah. They can. Well, you know, I mean, if you have two corporate executives meeting in a restaurant somewhere off the beaten path, Eh, 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 something's going on. They're not there, you know, just figuring out, you know, where they're going on holidays. Yep. So there was an entire industry of scouts, if you will, mm -hmm. on the lookout. What do you see? What do you know? What do you, you know, what do you think? So do you think that would be advantageous for the competition to invest in? No, I can't recommend, uh, you know, that kind of, um, you know, black ops. Mm -hmm. Not that, you know, it's not happening. I'm just saying that encouraging it could only lead to trouble for me. Oh, yes. And I'm trying to avoid trouble these days. Quite unethical, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Let's spy on other people for a living. <laughs> hey, it's happening. <laughs> it's hey, happening. It is, it is. There's cameras everywhere. You can't do anything and everything, like right in the building over here. Like, you know, I was too embarrassed to spit my gum out for the sake that somebody would see me. I swallowed it because I was just like, oh, that's not very ladylike. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's a good thing your husband wasn't here <laughs> and having a need. Sound. Yeah, <laughs> you'll always be seen. <laughs> that is true. That is true. But, you know, in, in that light, whenever I go into public places, I'm mm -hmm. always looking for the cameras. Mm -hmm. I don't know why. Right. But I'm looking to see where the cameras, why are they placed and so on. Just, I don't know, out of curiosity. Right. I do the exact same thing because if I'm parking in a parking lot, mm -hmm. I want to I want to be safe because of right. right. square one. You know, I look for that. I look for like the path and what's going like to next. I do that for a security. But then are the owners of those cameras, are they staying up to date on them? Are they applying right. their patches? Like, you know, are, are they getting hacked into? Or? Isn't, isn't those fancy malls, don't they, those those fancy malls have, like, lights on top of each parking space with a camera attached to it? Because whenever you go to, like, Sherway Gardens or, I'm not sure if Square One has it now, but they have a camera for each and every spot. Well, so they, they, they it's, for their, it's for their customers' oh, protection, though. Absolutely. Like, my wife mm -hmm. hates parking in a parkade, an underground parkade, mm -hmm. only because they're dark uh, anything can happen in them so you know trying to improve people's feeling of safety I'm not against that mm -hmm. what I am against is you know somebody tracking me and you know maybe exploiting my weakness in terms of business relationships and so on so if someone can track you down on the 427 driving down to Queensway and then when you get into Sherway Gardens there's the camera with you being parked in that spot if someone followed you like that you'd be scared wouldn't you well I, I wouldn't want to encourage it right <laughs> and you know so I and but I think that as well it's like okay so he's in that parking spot at Sherway oh who's he meeting 
Oh, what's he doing with Barb? Mm-hmm. He's married. He's got kids. She's married. What's going on? <laughs> what's going on? <laughs> He's gone to sport check. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, you know, speaking of all this like privacy stuff, there's a big, huge thing happening here in, in Canada, and that is that the CRTC thinks that it can regulate the Internet. <laughs> like, 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 what's up with that? Well, I mean, they've uh, missed the boat on every mandate they've ever been <laughs> given. So why do you think they're going to be successful in that? This is, you know, part of the political mm-hmm. process, if you will, the CRTC. You know, they uh, want to appear to be doing something while accomplishing absolutely nothing. Gotcha. And that's, you know, that's how they continue to roll their pay, their pay, their perks and their pensions. In fact, when I was the treasurer of the Alberta Motion Picture Industries Association, um, I went to, you know, uh, CRTC uh, hearings and that sort of thing. And I looked around and I said, boy, this is not a watchdog. This is a lapdog. Come here, boy. Come here. Come oh. here. <laughs> I mean, they're really, True. really pathetic. Mm-hmm. Wow. Stan. You didn't even move. <laughs> Stan's a member of our provincial review board. <laughs> He's censoring us. Okay. So we've seen lots of examples of ransomware, like here yes. in, in Canada. Like, you Ooh. know, what happened to like Midland and Wasega Beach. Like, yep. those were, were big ones. Mm-hmm. Poor Baltimore right now. Right. Yeah. Like, they're going through a. Uh, now, that's scary because they were, ta- they were talking about using technology that the NSA came up with, and they used that technology against Baltimore. Yeah, they're, Baltimore's just going down. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, it's never well, been up. That's true. Right. I mean, Baltimore, you know, is a, mm-hmm. kind of a beat up port city and, you know, you just got to live with that. Bull, but, bulls in the buses. Huh? I remember that. <laughs> but the cyberware coming out of the NSA mm-hmm. that was exploited to the, you know, continued misery of the city of Baltimore. Um, you know, I, I can only say when I saw that, I said, oh, Dr. Frankenstein, you're not happy with your creation. <laughs> you know, it's, it's one of these things, like you create these things, and how does it get out of the NSA into the hands of hackers? Very, very easily. Yeah. Like, you know, it doesn't take a lot. All the biggest hacks, like, you know what, our USB injected, you mm-hmm. know what, malware. I know when I was with... Uh, Kyle from uh, Huntress um, Labs, he has a fabulous tool that uh, we use, and it's for after you've been victim of a crime. So what happens is it's all about prevention, prevention, and intervention, because afterwards you're screwed. It's like getting robbed. Yeah. And the biggest thing about getting robbed is that how do you get past that feeling of, oh, what was that noise? Or I heard something. How or, do you explain it to your customers? Exactly. How do you go to your customers and say, I'm sorry? Somebody got into you through me. How do you think you retain those accounts? Oh, not. You know what, Lou? I, I preach the same thing. And as of November 1st, 2018, new laws came out that says when that happens, you have to say what data was leaked, what you did to prevent it, were you aware of it beforehand? And essentially, if you were irresponsible or careless and you knew and you let all of this happen because it's pretty easily because there's reports that come out just like Equifax they mm-hmm. they knew um, you end up getting fined Kyle's to um, Kyle's service from Huntress Labs is Basically, um, he have, runs this scan afterwards, and what it does is it sees if there's any malware left. Like, it's a very light software, because what happens is when this software gets injected, when this malware gets injected, it's all about reporting the information back. So what his tool does is find those hooks, and he can tell you if there's something, like, lurking on um, the network. Because you're right. When you've been hacked, like, in the U.S., if you've been hacked or you've been, if you've suffered a breach, you have to post it. So you can walk into, like, a Walmart or Sears or a Nordstrom, and it will say, like, you know what, uh, you're being scanned for this, we were victims of this, this, and this, like, you know, and they're like kind of like a pedophile in your neighborhood, like that type of Yeah, a bit of profiling that way. That's exactly mm. it. Whereas we don't have that here in Canada, mm. and attacks are happening all the time. You only hear about, like, you know what, the, the big ones when they make the news, like mm. when Marriott with the City TV. But Panama Papers, that's a really, really big one, and that's like on like the low, low, low. So if you got, all of a sudden money appears to keep it all um, secret, but you don't hear about, like, you know, the small business that has like, you know, three or four computers, nice mom, pa uh, shop going on. And all of a sudden they get um, hit with like, you know, a thousand dollars or $2,000, mm-hmm. but they're only making like, you know, what 
100000 or $200,000 a year in, in top line revenues. Like, that's going to hurt. Like, you're taking food away from Put someone. Put them out of business, yeah. right? That's exactly it. Mm-hmm. You lose the data. Like, it's it's horrible. You know, uh, Barb, one of the, some of the research I did in preparation uh, mm-hmm. for being with you today, you know, indicated the average time to identify a data breach in the United States in this report is 196 days. So you've got a festering, weeping wound, and it's not identified for 196 days oh. Oh. before and before you can take action. So what's the best medicine is prevention, as we know. Mm-hmm. And, you know, if I could advocate for anything for people listening to this podcast, um, don't wait. See something, hear something, fear something, act. Tell somebody and get them working on the account in order to harden your perimeter so that people can't get into your valuable data cache and cause you nothing but grief, nothing. And the distraction, you know, you talk about a ma and pa operation with three computers and what have you. Hey, the distraction that comes from a breach will prevent you from contacting profitable accounts, prevent you from dealing with prospects that could convert into profitable accounts, and all of a sudden, you don't have a business anymore. You have a problem-solving cash drain. Mm -hmm. Oh, the worst. So do you think more laws will help stop cyber attacks? Like, what could... No, I don't think the laws... I mean, they're already being broken, right? So I don't think laws are the solution. I think the solution is to get, you know, Joe and Jane the pro Mm -hmm. onto your site and have them start building the defensive capabilities necessary to harden your perimeter and to stay current with what's going on in the industry. So right now we're living in the domain of the Internet of Things. So all these things are now connected, right? I can look at my fridge on my phone. I can, uh, you know, tell my slow cooker to turn on or whatever it is. That's a, a, a vulnerability point. That's, a, that's the weak link in the chain right now. And when they talk about things like self-driving cars, I only cringe. <laughs> Why? Because it wouldn't take much to, and we've seen it you know, proven in tests and so on, that you can hack into those systems already. And you know, when you talk about you know, fleets of drones delivering packages and all that, that's a disruption waiting to happen. Right. Why? Because, you know, as you go this fast in the deployment of uh, technology, oh, we didn't think about that. That's usually the most common type of thing. And you were talking earlier about patches and so on and Mm -hmm. so on. Well, that's been the habit of the technology industry. Yeah, just get it out there. Get it. We'll fix it later. Right. Which can be a real problem when you talk about hackers getting into your money, hackers getting into your uh, safety. Mm -hmm. Right. Like, you know, uh, Internet of Things. Hey, you know, you turn off somebody's heart machine. uh, That's a dead person right there. It's funny because the first computer virus Mm -hmm. was built because People were not paying for software. They were pirating it. Mm -hmm. So these software people, these intellectual people that spent like, you know, a a lot of time putting this software together to provide a service to make your life easier, they um, were getting ripped off. So they're just like, this is not fair. So they had to develop a virus to ensure that this software was only being licensed once or like, you know, people were paying for what they were getting and not being greedy. So it's kind of like come full circle where now it's a little bit uh, out of control. Now someone can hack into your temperature thermostat and find out how, how warm you like it in your house. Now someone can turn off your lights without realizing it because people can now buy smart light bulbs. Yeah. My gosh. So it, it's just, um, but it's all about people being cheap. Mm-hmm. You know? Well, it's, it's, you know, it's always a competition between unlimited wants and limited means. So if I come into anybody's universe and say, so where are you spending your money? How do you want to spend it? You know, and they'll often tell you, I can't cut back over here or I can't spend over here because I got to spend over there. And, you know, convincing them to take the prudent course takes, number one, they have to trust you. And number two, you've got to make the case that they have to act. 
or open themselves up to no business, no life, right? And grief at home, right? Like, have you ever had that experience at home where uh, your Netflix account isn't coming on? Mm. It's like, you know, three uh, three alarm fires. <laughs> Dad, the, the, the Netflix isn't working. Da, 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 da. It's like, th- once you have a breach, I mean, not a breach, that's not a breach, but once you have an event around your technology, in your home, you know how those bells are going off, that they want response now, right? Solve that problem now. And I think that in corporate America, corporate Canada, private sector Canada, you know, if you're not really building in a, um, a, a paratrooper uh, uh, division that can come in and drop into your problem and solve it as quickly as possible because they know the account, they know the technology, they know what you have, uh, you're just asking for a big headache. And as you were saying, Barb, it's pretty affordable, right? Oh, it's super it, it, for lack of a better word, it, it's cheap. It can be broken down to, depending on what it is. Can I just recommend? Never say cheap. Only say value price. Okay, mm. it's value priced. <laughs> it's value priced. Affordable. <laughs> <laughs> Right, because cheap implies low quality, and we never want to imply that. Right? Good point. Okay. <laughs> cheap is out of there. Out of there. Cut out that. Of there. Get that out of the lexicon. When I interact with prospects, and for those of you listening, you know I'm talking about you. When you say we just don't have the money for that, um, I sit there. I'm like, okay, well, what do you have the money for? Not for this. This is... Okay, so you want to talk about that problem? Absolutely. Okay, so when uh, dealing with somebody says, we don't have money for that, Mm -hmm. you know, I always ask, do you have a phone? And if they say, yes, I have a phone, I say, well, it's not that much more expensive than a phone. Okay. (laughs) Right? So you've got to make it comparable. And where did I learn this valuable lesson? Mm -hmm. My daughter, Madeline, wanted a dog. And I didn't want to give her a dog because I didn't want to take care of a dog. Do you have pets at home, Barbara? Oh, I got a bird. His okay. name is Jet. Okay, so he stays in a cage, though. And are you the one cleaning the cage? No, I'm not. But oh, I'm stepping in look bird shit all over the place. <laughs> okay. I'm like, hey, this bird is supposed to stay in the cage, but that's oh, another issue. Oh, <laughs> another story. So I didn't want to take care of the dog, and I offered my daughter. I, I, I was tortured. She's my unique child. Mm-hmm. That's the way I say instead of an only child, because only kind of implies lonely, like you should have other. I'm an only child. I'm very unique. I can relate. Right. Okay. So you can relate. <laughs> so... Um, I, I I was tortured because she was like crying, Daddy, I want somebody to love. And I said, well, you can love me. And she says, I don't want to love you. I said, great, let me solve this problem. And I, I went to her and I, I realized I couldn't have a pet in my house. And I said, Madeline, you know, I've decided that the only thing I can give you, I can't give you a pet, but I can give you money. How about a hundred bucks? And Madeline said to me, uh, no, Daddy, no. She's got me up to 500 bucks. Right. And she's still saying no. And what I finally realized was that there was no value to 500 bucks to her. And then when I finally realized what she valued, I said, Madeline, you realize with 600 bucks, that was my next pitch. That represents six American girl dolls, something that she cherished and loved and wanted more of. No, daddy. I'm up to 700 bucks. I'm pulling my hair out. Well, you can see I don't have any hair left, right? Because she's 16 now. And um, she still's not saying yes. So I get up to $900 and tell her it's nine American Girl dolls. And she says, no, Daddy. I said, okay, Matt, that's my final offer. And as I got up to walk away, she said, wait a minute, Daddy. Bing. I knew she saw the value. So we signed a Maddie Daddy contract. I gave her a hundred dollar bonus, so for a thousand dollars, I I haven't had any pets in my house. Now I've had ongoing conversation about pets, but the answer is always no. And she did offer to buy back the option to uh, <laughs> have a pet, mm-hmm. and I told her that the new you know, well that was I yeah I bought it for uh, from you for a thousand dollars. It's going to cost you a million to buy it from me. <laughs> Buy so, low, sell high. <laughs> well, so what I'm trying to say is, you got to find the value proposition, mm-hmm. right? So when I, you know, when I talk, we used to talk to uh, prospects about value. What do they value, right? 
So, you know, if you have a price point that says, you know, this service to take care of your 10, 12, 5, 6, whatever number of uh, chairs, right, is going to be X, ask yourself, what are they spending on phones? What are they spending on air conditioning? What are they spending on stupid stuff? And give them a comparable and say, well, yeah, I'm willing to spend that on this. What is, the, you know, in the value chain against the risk of what? Blowing it all up. Mm-hmm. It's it's kind of like insurance, right? Oh, absolutely. It is because even in Canada, we don't have cyber uh, insurance. If they sell it, your cyber insurance that you get, it's to pay a portion of your ransomware which is whoopty because one in four people don't get their data back even after they pay. And the rider on that is like so much money per month. Your only insurance is to have a proper backup system, to have a proper continuity system. And when I mean a backup system, I don't mean like that USB that you plug in or those external hard drives. You need to be backing up the operating systems, the programs, and the data. You need to back it up locally because sometimes the internet is not available. No. So, and then you need to back it up to the internet as well, mm-hmm. because sometimes things can happen locally. Like it, it's hardware, it, it breaks, like, you know, it needs to be replaced. You need to have a backup someplace else. Mm-hmm. So people, um, I find that they're slowly coming around to see um, the value as I'm out there meeting with IT directors, like, you know, everyone is all gung ho about implementing um, the tools and the, it's like everybody wants the Cadillac of everything. And then as soon as you start pricing it, you're just like, uh, well, um, the value of it um, has changed, and perhaps not this quarter, but next quarter, just like Equifax did. Mm-hmm. Like you know, because they're they're people, they have departments to run. You know, it's it's cost per person. You know, per workstation. How do you keep everything going? And but you know, I mean, you can't implement a hundred percent solution in a moment. It, you can always phase in those things and look at the priority. Right? Where is the weakness? Like for an individual. Right. In society today, where's the vulnerability? It's on a mobile uh, device, right? Yeah, because mobile attacks, they're up to, what, 92,000 per day? Yeah. Like, there's new ones happening all the time. Like, it's crazy. And everything. And if you find this, like, if you find uh, my phone, you're going to see who my friends are, who I'm texting. You're going to see pictures of everything. You're going to see my entire um, life. And if it's kind of like Jeff Bezos. <laughs> his, his whole life came out all at once, didn't it, Bart? <laughs> yeah, it, yeah, it did. That, that only cost, what, 79 or $69 billion or something? <laughs> but half of it will be donated to charity. <laughs> that's, his, that's his wife's. That's his wife's end. He didn't tell us what he's doing with his end. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we already figured out what he's doing with his end. Give that big booty a slam. That's a bit of a ransom. (laughs) (laughs) So, you know, you look at mobile as a vulnerability, a site of potential vulnerability, a weak link in the chain. You know, what are people doing on their devices, right? Everything. Mm -hmm. Right. And where is the vulnerabilities coming in? Uh, In terms of spyware, ransomware, viruses, 27% of malicious apps are found in lifestyle apps. So people that are going to various sites. Now, they didn't define lifestyle, (laughs) right? I get it. They're all trying to escape. I tell people this all the time. Like, you know, when you um, want to escape from work, from family, you go on the Internet. Right. And I have to remind people the Internet is not safe. Right. Like people like they think that it's all good. It's legitimate. It's it's okay, Mm -hmm. Um, But it's not. It's a bad area. It's a bad neighborhood. Right. So basically you're talking about, you know, avoiding. Um, high risk environments. Yeah. Right? If you can, if you can control yourself, right? Like when we're talking about lifestyle, anything's possible. That's uh, 27% of uh, malicious apps are in those kind of uh, lifestyle sites. And then 20% are music. So there you are looking for your, you know, got to have Frank Sinatra or whatever turns your crank and you're uh, getting, you know, tagged and bagged right there. Yep. It's cra- it's it's insane. It's happening all the time. People really have to be aware of what they're clicking, what they're um, tapping. If you don't know who's texting it, mm-hmm. they're participating in 
radio contest. You know, the Raptors, the only way you're going to get cheap tickets at the moment is if you're listening to radio stations. Well, nobody's inviting me from Hummel and Fred Radio to, <laughs> to go to the Raptors t- tomorrow night. Phil? Uh, I think well, that's a security protocol. <laughs> Uh, are you getting good with Marley's? <laughs> we can do Marley's. <laughs> <laughs> we can do the Marley's. I love it. Or you know what? Why don't we get um, Howard to have a, a break in the garage, and when he gets escorted in, we'll just follow him. <laughs> <laughs> so the other thing uh, in terms of the research, Barb, about mm-hmm. vulnerabilities, uh, third-party uh, app stores, 99% of uh, – of discovered malware comes from a third-party app store. So instead of buying your apps from a legitimate retailer like the Apple Store or what have you, people are going to sites they're not aware of, and they're buying applications that are just like one big, dirty biohazard. Yes, and it happens to kids, too, because mm-hmm. you know what? You're hooked up in the family's network mm. of phones. You're sharing um, data. And you know what? They're looking at apps for games and things like that. And if they're four years and up, they can easily download it and it's free. And it's kids that are, are bringing it in. They don't know. Um, it's um, elderly people. You tell well, you tell stories all the time, Phil. <laughs> <laughs> you mean my parents? Yes. Oh, my goodness. It's like having one with an Amazon tablet, the other with an iPhone, and they have no idea what an app is. It's like, why do you mean app? I don't know what an app is, Phil. And they come into the network, mm. and all of a sudden, you don't know what's going on mm. and not in, until it's too late. And then all of your information is out there, and you're like, how did this happen? Next thing you know it, you find out that um, someone is knocking on your door right. because uh, you've missed a mortgage payment. <laughs> and you're just like, I didn't even know that I own um, this house. It happens um, a lot. And it could be as simple as, why isn't this free Chinese movie app showing me movies? It's like, no, that's a hacker, mom. That's a hacker. Thank goodness you don't store your information on here. Yeah. <laughs> it's like you don't know how to. Right, exactly. <laughs> but if your information is on the device, they can easily get get in. And these um, hacks that are happening, they're, they're not new. Mm-hmm. It's just been reinvented. Like before there used to be mail fraud yeah. where you'd get... Um, uh, you get mail sent to you. It wouldn't be to you. You'd put return to sender. You send it back. And the next thing you know, it Canada Post puts a thing on your mailbox that says, um, hey, if you've changed your uh, address, um, okay, we, we got you. If you didn't request this, please call us and let us know. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, where people are, where this is happening, like this is the same type of thing that's happening in people's emails. It's just not tangible anymore. You can't really see it. That's exactly it. A few years ago, our our mailbox lock was changed for some reason. I don't know why. And so when we went to the local post office, we found out someone filled out a form. Now, the good news is it was someone from a different address on the same street that changed their their mailbox. So it wasn't malicious. It wasn't like someone was trying to steal our mail. But something as simple as that could cause trouble if it was online. And then here in Canada, you're mm-hmm. right, here in Canada, what happens is, is you have the whole French and English thing happening, mm. street and rue and things like that. Like it's, it's like the equivalent of someone changing your email password. Like you don't realize it until you hit it and, and it's not visual, is it? When you try to log in until, until you actually type in your password, you don't know if anyone's tampered with it, right? Yeah, that's yeah. right. And then you try your other password, and then your super duper password, and then you try your super duper exquisite top secret password, and then next thing you know, it um, someone has all of your passwords. They've gone to LinkedIn. They figured out what your email convention is uh, for the company that you work at, and you're targeting um, that person where it is that they work. And then next thing you know, it they're in the business network, and who are they targeting? You know, HR, the IT directors, the um, financial people, the CEOs, the presidents, because they're the ones that all have access to, to the everything. Purse. That's exactly mm-hmm. to everything. It. Yeah. So you have all this CEO fraud. Like it's it's a massive epidemic. When you look at the uh, cost to the average corporation worldwide of a breach, it's like three point eight six million. When you look in the U.S., which is the deep pocket, right? Like if you're mm-hmm. going to go hunting, hunt for the big game, it's like closer to $7.9 million. And, um, you know, that's serious. Now, most companies, most small to medium-sized enterprises are not getting tagged at that level. That would be a senior corporate, uh, corporate environment. But, um, you know, think about it in terms of this. 
If you look at what the U.S. government spends on uh, cybersecurity, it's about $15 billion. It's up 4% since 2018. Now, take that number, $15 billion, and divide it by how much the budget of the U.S. government is, and it should give you a rule of thumb on how much you should be spending on your uh, cybersecurity. That's what I would do, mm -hmm. right? Because most of that spending is on military cybersecurity, because let's face it, we don't want anybody with their fingers on the button, mm -hmm. right? That is true. <laughs> right. <laughs> Do you know what percentage that would be? I'd have to crunch that. I didn't have time when I was doing it to find the U.S. government budget, but it's in the trillions, so $15 billion in a trillion is very small. Point zero something something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, you know, I, I think the U.S. government uh, budget is close to $2 trillion. But mm -hmm. you know what? I'll, I'll send you an email once okay. I get home. Already then. But it's a very small percentage of spending, of revenue. And ironically, cybersecurity this year is suspected to be a trillion dollar industry. So all of this money, it's out there and it's exchanging hands or pockets or or, or my little online credit cards or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And you know what? When someone's losing, another person is winning. Right. So the money is out there. It's going someplace. But it should go to somebody providing you with a service, not to somebody who's stealing from you, right? Absolutely. I think that's going to be my next value proposition, Joe Smoko. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I, I look at it and say to myself, you know, would you buy a car without a, without a key lock? Would you buy a home and live in a home without uh, security? Mm -hmm. You know, would you, you know, would you do anything without securing your personal safety, the safety of your family, the safety of your possessions, right? I mean, we know auto theft is big. We know that house break-ins are big and we do everything to secure that. Why not take the same approach towards your data? Agreed. Mm -hmm. Because when it comes to the internet, people going to escape, um, the internet is a bad area. We all strive to live in good neighborhoods where you want to have the security of being able to relax and walk to your car and not worry about um, the safety. video or to have it there, to have your safety uh, in place. And when it's not there, you tend to be more alert. So people need to remember that when you're out there, when you're on these web apps, when you're downloading things, when you're uploading um, things, like what information are you sharing? Because you're going into an environment Mm -hmm. that is not safe and you need to have security in place to keep yourself safe to keep your children safe to keep your family safe to keep your money safe so that everybody can move forward in a positive direction you know I was watching a uh, conversation a talk that Fre uh, Frank Abagnale the uh, the guy the, catch me if you can right mm -hmm. and uh, he's a, a security expert for the FBI now so he went through all this uh, impersonation stuff over the years uh, when he was much younger he spent some time in jail but he got hired by the FBI to be uh, in, involved in their cybersecurity area and uh, he was very clear that you need to be diligent about how you're doing any of your transactions online and the one thing i got from that talk i believe it was a google talk i don't know if mm -hmm. you follow those at all and um you know he said you know people are you know using their debit card as if there's no vulnerability there's nothing more vulnerable for an individual than using their debit card because you know if somebody gets your pin from your debit card they have access to all your cash right then right there Whereas, you know, he, he advised, just use your credit card, because if there's a breach of the credit card, the issuer eats the loss because mm -hmm. they're, you know, a much bigger institution and they don't want to discourage you from, you know, clipping 3% off all your purchases, right? The CDIC will not protect you. No. When you sign up for my cybersecurity tips, that's one of the first emails that I, I send out mm -hmm. is that in the event you're a victim of bank fraud or mm -hmm. a wire transfer, the CDIC will not protect you. Now, when you have a bank account and you have that 
Access six, card? Yes, your access card. And they send you that the terms and, and agreement that you ha- you're forced to sign in order to have a bank account. It says you're responsible for your own security of your machines and devices. And in the event that someone... You're on gets, your own. That's exactly it. I'm sorry. Yep. We, you had it. You lost it. Your problem, not mine. Right. And, you know, typically, you know, with my daughter and so on, I said, don't keep a lot of cash in the one in the account. I call it her, she calls it her bagel account. <laughs> so she's got a card. She can go and pay for bagels and what have you. I said, don't keep the mother load there. That's just a vulnerability. Mm-hmm. You know, if somebody gets in there, they get it all. You're almost better off putting it in a mattress. <laughs> 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 Going old school. Mm-hmm. All right. So... F- Gentlemen. Barb. Mr. Skeezus. Yes, Barb. What is the most important thing you have ever learned? Most important thing? It's uh, everything is about human development Mm -hmm. and human relations. So the relationships that you have personally and professionally are your real value. And the only real asset you ever have is time. So you got to use it uh, fruitfully. Don't waste it. Wow. That's the best one we ever had, eh, Phil? Absolutely. Okay. Mm-hmm. Well, you've been listening to Lou Skeezus. Lou, how can people get a hold of you? Because I know you have a big fan club. Yeah, you can go to happycapitalism.com, register mm-hmm. there, and or you can send me an email, lou at happycapitalism.com. Uh, if you're in the Oakville area and you want to grab a coffee, send me an email. Okay. I'll let Joe Spoko know. <laughs> So if any of our listeners have any questions about their IT and vulnerabilities or have to want to know if any of their credentials are out there on the dark web so that they're not victims of fraud of any type or cybercrime, give me a shout at 905-542-9759 or visit cdntechnologies.com. And you can always reach me direct at barbarap.tv. Oh,